Hi, my name is Gosia Szepulska and I'm the Southeast Brand Chair. Welcome you all to today's presentation on safeguarding and utility detection by Team Over from Atkins. Um, a team Over works for Atkins and he manages key clients within our utility solution practice. He's been involved in, in providing varied utilities information for projects like HS2 and Heathrow expansion program and many cable and pipeline routes over the last five years. Tim represents the Chartered Institution of Civil Engineering Surveyors as a regional secretary and is involved in the utility and sub versus um, mapping panel and the 2040 forum. Uh, so the presentation is about to start. If you have got any questions, please type them in into the chat box and we'll answer them after the presentation. And if I can ask you all, please to turn your cameras off and mute your microphones, please. Thank you. Team, over to you. Thanks very much. And thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, Catherine, you mentioned this be recorded as well. So I'm just checking we've, uh, we've started on that. Yes, we have. Brilliant. Okay. Um, I, thanks, Gosha. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to uh, present. I'm uh, going to try and not speak uh, too technically. Um, there is a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, words behind, behind my, uh, my speech. So um, I will try and make that as clear as possible. Um, but just as, a, as an overall view, um, this is just a snapshot into the world of safe digging and, and utility detection. Um, and what you should be able to get at the end of it, um, after the next sort of half an hour or so, is how, what, why, where, um, you know, in terms of in buried utilities. So I hope to explain that. Um, everybody should be able to see my screen. Um, if you can't, put something in the chat box and I'll just uh, see what I can do. But um, if somebody could just tell me that they can see what I'm seeing, and I've got a brief agenda just there. So. Let's crack on. Uh, initially, I'll talk briefly about uh, a safety moment. That's uh, something we uh, always uh, start with at the start of our meetings here at Atkins. Um, I'll then just speak more about uh, an introduction to our practice um, and also into the, the role of utilities in our, in our industry in the UK. Um, I'll speak about a little bit of background uh, regarding uh, the current situation. Uh, and then I talk a little bit about compliance uh, specifications and best practice within the industry. Um, I'll also share with you the, the processes that uh, we uh, currently use at Atkins and there's a, a live uh, utility uh, ordering process that I'll, I'll guide you through. I'll also talk about things like uh, diversionary works and some consultancy services in terms of next steps. And as Gosha uh, highlighted, there'll be a, a Q and A at the end. So, um, if we do use the chat function uh, for any questions, I'll try and get through as, as many as I can. Um, so for 15 minutes or so afterwards. Um, if anybody's got any sensitive queries or uh, something that might just be uh, uh, better off putting an email, um, I'll give my, my email towards the end of the presentation uh, for any uh, specific queries like that. Okay, so uh, safety and well-being moment. Um, I'll just flick to my next slide, uh, is a stat. Uh, figures, the, the latest figures, 2018 to 19, um, indicate that 30 f fatalities occurred in the construction sector. That's 30 people that are going to work uh, and not coming home. Um, and that can be completely avoided. Um, working, excavating around utilities continues to be a key risk. We've got to do something. We've got the power to do things, to try and make, make things safer. Uh, and, and one of those things is to make sure people know what's underground prior to digging. So a little bit about me, Gosha uh, has already uh, introduced me. Uh, I have been with Atkins for five years. Um, prior to that, I worked with a surveying company um, offering uh, new equipment to actually make sure people were uh, mapping assets uh, as accurately as possible. Prior to that, I worked with a, an asset surveying company um, that actually worked with Garmin uh, 
and basically mapped a, a significant amount of, uh, of highway assets. And I've worked in best part of about 48 different countries last time I, I counted. Um, and then before that, I, uh, I studied geology at, at University of Portsmouth. Um, so that's a little bit about my background. Now I'm, I'm working within the uh, utility solutions practice within Atkins. I've been here for, for five years. Uh, I'm also a regional secretary with the Chartered Institution of Civil Engineering Surveyors, and I am involved with the utilities and subsurface mapping panel. Um, so I hope that just gives me a little bit of an <laughs> oversight into the industry. Um, of course, there's uh, many, many people with this industry, and actually uh, some of my colleagues on that, that panel um, provide really interesting ways of thinking. And uh, this group of people allows us not to think about what has been done in the past, but also what new digital geospatial techniques we could involve uh, to, to try and make things uh, suitable for the, for the 21st century. So what about utilities themselves? Well, I mentioned that stat about 30 people uh, unfortunately being killed. I think um, Nicole, who actually did this uh, research of what do utility strikes really cost is on the call. Um, so hi, Nicole, again, if you're there. Um, we have uh, best part of about one and a half million holes dug every year. Um, now that goes across the country and, and that's 29,000 separate sites uh, per week, which is an astonishing amount of, uh, of work that goes on. Um, now they can be as, as small as things like drop curbs um, in various local authorities. So not everything is, you know, digging a, a hole the size of a quarry. Um, but on these sites, um, we, we get reports of utility strikes and some go unreported. So the figure might actually be uh, a lot higher than it currently is. Um, but 44% of utility strikes are on gas and electricity assets. And those are, are assets that are mapped somewhere, hopefully. Um, but we know that mapping is a, a, an issue and actually seeing underground is virtually impossible. Um, but there are some techniques that hopefully will just uh, make that uh, a bit more clear. Um, where some utilities exist, uh, they might not actually be found using a, uh, I thought I would say a, a piece of equipment called a cap, which I'll explain a bit later on. So a little bit more about uh, the problem uh, that we face uh, in terms of actually the, the UK uh, utility industry, there's quite a lot of them. Um, so where we've got different providers for electricity and gas and water, there's a lot of different providers for uh, fibre now as well. Um, there's also a lot of different local authorities who might maintain their own assets. Um, so that number of, of 200 utilities is, is more or less the, the amount of utilities uh, Atkins actually search as part of our uh, utility search report uh, program, which again, I'll, I'll show you a bit later on. But all these different companies will have different approaches for managing their assets. They'll have different techniques and standards for actually mapping those and, and how they're actually shown on uh, on either physical maps but also on digital uh, software. They also have a, a differing amount of resource available to, to issue these plans and maybe provide some uh, open access but some do not. Uh, some provide their information to uh, different suppliers of which you can obtain many utilities at one point but not all of them. There's also some different interpretation of the new Roads and Street Works Act, 1991, um, how some access is provided free of charge. Um, some, you know, you, you've got to go and uh, visit certain utilities offices to view those plans. Um, some are available um, immediately. Some you have to pay. So I'll just look a little bit on that. But there's a bit of a complicated picture as uh, to the utility arrangement in the UK. So I'm just going to try and simplify that as, as best as I can. Um, but really the, the ultimate fact at the end of it is that, uh, and it's, it's exemplified in this quote quite nicely, that utilities may not be the most exciting or fashionable element in a, of a construction project, but the risks they impose on projects mean that if they're not managed correctly, utilities can be the most vital element. And that's it in a nutshell. Um, depending on whatever you're building, um, if you don't know what's underground, uh, you could you could really uh, cause a lot of delay, uh, a lot of expense to a particular project if you don't actually know what you're looking at um, at the earliest point. Um, so that's where we come in. 
uh, and we satisfy a couple of uh, uh, specifications or guidance notes and this is where I don't really want to get into too much detail but just offer a bit of a high level explanation of to uh, these three uh, different uh, guidance measures or, or legislation so firstly HSG 47 to excuse me this is uh, a published piece of guidance um, which basically uh, outlines how to avoid uh, problems with buried services. Um, safety is, is at the uh, fundamental, uh, it, well, safety is fundamental as part of this uh, uh, specification as per the other two. Um, but again, this is, this is guidance rather than legislation. So it just tells you what you should do. Um, and likewise, the, the PAS 128 is a spec specification for best practice. Um, now it outlines different stages. Um, it, there's a, uh, a key going from quality level D up to quality level C, B and A, which I'll explain shortly. Um, and that's, that's, as I mentioned, still best practice. Uh, the legislative side is CDM 2015. Um, legally, uh, as, a, as a client or as a, as a designer, um, utility planning is critical and that it must be done. Um, and buried utilities should form part of those CDM 2015 requirements. And that is the ultimate uh, compliance measure that needs to be followed legally. That is your legislation. So CDM 2015. The other two, best practice guidance. So moving on, and there's a nice little uh, uh, shot of the HSC, uh, that's HSG 47. Uh, there's various documents that um, I'll just quote a bit further on. So it's a, a little bit more about PAS 128. This is uh, specifically a best practice for uh, detection, verification, and locating existing uh, underground utilities. The idea is um, that you follow a, a, a chain of survey types, starting from D going through to C, B, and A. Um, to give you an overview, survey type D is a, a desktop utility search, which I'll just provide a bit more information as we go through. Uh, survey type C, is uh, actually an on-site walkover survey to see exactly what you can see above ground. Uh, survey type B is where we might engage uh, electromagnetic locations or uh, ground penetrating ra radar uh, or a variety of other measures, uh, Cat and Jenny for example. And then survey type A um, is the only uh, survey type where you can actually uh, properly ascertain which utilities are where because you have got eyes on that particular asset through things like trial holes. Uh, so the idea of, of PAS 128, and it's actually um, just undergoing a bit of a review at the moment. Um, so this was issued back in 2014, um, but we're halfway through a, a review stage, I think. Um, public consultation was uh, done at the start of the year, I believe. Um, and we're, we're just in a phase now where uh, some, some amendments might be being made, but um, due to the, uh, the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, I don't know if that's um, just been delayed or so. Um, I think there's a few people on the call that might um, be aware of, of the situation on that, but um, we'll see how that, that develops. But as we are at the moment, PAS 128 2014 um, is the best practice and just uh, outlines what you should be doing, starting from survey type D, going through the, the stages on, on any particular site. That's not to say every site requires uh, a, a trial hole, um, but certainly every site does require a, a buried utility search. And just a little bit more about uh, a survey type D and what you should be uh, ascertaining as part of a desktop study. You need to identify all asset owners in the survey area. We request as part of uh, our services, but obviously every uh, uh, other services do exist that actually do this for you. Um, so we request and collate all the information from these identified utilities. Uh, we receive their affected and not affected plans and compile them in a nice report. Uh, but what we also do is provide a, a, a map. So we've got all affected utilities. You can see this on the, the right hand side of your screen just now, um, just showing all buried assets uh, on a nice, easy to see map. Uh, and that can be uh, delivered in, in a variety of formats. Um, in, including DWG, um, uh, a shape file, uh, even a layered PDF. Um, and whilst people have been working from home, actually some uh, software packages might not have been uh, available on, on separate laptops and things. 
Um, so we've actually just been using uh, some uh, some KML file formats as well, just to uh, uh, try and make it a bit easier. It's been an interesting uh, few weeks with with a few different tools that people have been using uh, as a result of our KML deliverables, which I'll tell you about shortly. So the next thing I'm, I'm going to show you is uh, an order process. How do you actually get all these plans? So I'm just going to uh, just share my screen slightly differently with uh, our website. And on this, this is open source, uh, and anybody can access this. Uh, you might find uh, your company already has an account with us. Um, but basically, this is uh, readytodig.co.uk, um, and our, our homepage is uh, just a little bit about Atkins, but really the ultimate uh, item is this start search. And you could pick any site in the UK. I'm just going to choose one that I prepared earlier in Greenwich. Once you clicked on that particular location, you can put a postcode in there. You can identify your site. I'm going to choose one around the, uh, the O2 here, and I'm going to include the roads. And it's uh, commonly known, but um, not widely known, um, that all the utilities uh, in a particular area might be focused in the, in the highway or the footways. So I'm making sure that I'm including the area that I need to be searched. Uh, what I can do is edit this site boundary just to uh, make it a little a bit larger. I can include nearby roadways or highways. Uh, I can also include uh, any tunnels. So you've got, I think this is the Jubilee line coming through here. So um, it might be interesting to know actually how close the Jubilee line might actually get to our particular site. Um, so once I'm happy with that search area, I'll click continue. And what's going on at the moment, we have a, a, a rather useful tool called a disbursement engine. And what that's doing is calculating how many utilities operate within that area and uh, the area size that we're looking to search. And it also gives me an option to say what I want. So do I want a utility search report? But I also want the map as well. Uh, and in the time that I've done that, it's told me that uh, we would search 29 separate utilities. Now, that's not to say that 29 utilities are affected in that area but we are going to search 29 utilities who we know operate there or thereabouts um, just to make sure that we're uh, making our, our PAS 128 uh, compliance uh, there. And the, the size of the site is 24.37 hectares. Uh, and I'm just going to key in a couple of different uh, details. Um, it's going to ask me what description of uh, work I'm doing. So I'll just say I'm designing something. don't know, maybe another uh, Millennium Dome type building uh, or an extension to that uh, and it asked me a turnaround time we currently offer 5 10 15 and 20 working days we also do a one working day search um, that's not available on this particular site at the moment um, so I'm just going to select let's just do a 20 working day uh, and it will just ask me a few more information a few more bits of information it could ask me what format I'd like the uh, information as well uh, so I'm going to say I'm going to have a DWG file um, and I've got a topo already, so you can use that mapping. Um, in fact, I'm just going to change this. So, and that's ready to go. All I need to do is continue through here. It's going to give me a, a cost. Um, so £195 will do a utility search. Some utilities in this area are going to charge us £184 for their plans, uh, and the mapping is going to cost £155. So, near enough 500 pounds uh, I can go ahead and place my utility search um, and just a quick next uh, uh, button is to place your order so if I just go back to my uh, presentation I'm going to show you what you get out the other end so once we've done that if she's producing them all because they found to be some mismatch oh, or something. Can somebody just uh, move their mic just please? Um, um, so at the other end, uh, once we've uh, received that order, um, we start our, start our process. So you'll get a confirmation to say this is the area. Now I, I take it the, the site that I've done previously is slightly different to the one that I uh, just showed you just then. But uh, for illustration, you'll get a, a summary of what you've ordered. Um, where it is, a map showing your search area um, and uh, the services you provided, so a report and a map. The next part, so after the 20 working days or 10 working days, five working days, whatever you like, 
you'll get a status report. And this will follow a, a red, amber, green um, uh, report summary. So affected utilities are shown in red, not affected utilities are shown in green. And sometimes we don't receive a response from a certain utility or, or local authority, and that will be listed in orange. Um, but something on that is where we don't receive a response. We're, uh, we're chasing for that actual response to make sure that uh, you, know, you know whether they're affected or not affected in a particular area. And furthermore, the utility search map, uh, as I showed just earlier in my presentation, you'll get a, uh, a complete overview showing affected and uh, those uh, layers just shown, uh, showing different utilities. And that's using a standard uh, line specification, uh, but where different companies might have their own uh, line types and, and styles, we can incorporate that as well. So we're, we're working on the same hymn sheet. So I've got some samples. Um, I'll, I'll issue these to, to Catherine and, and these are available on the website if you're interested to have a look. Um, that's a sample utility search report and I just showed you a, a sample map as well. So that's an easy way to actually understand uh, the, the desktop element. Uh, we've got decent ways of actually trying to incorporate that for various sites. So if you're mostly working on rail projects, we've got a nice linear tool um, that can be used as well as, as road projects as well, that will actually give you either 25 meters or 50 meters buffer around the, uh, the edge of that, um, but also gives you a significant distance as part of our, uh, our standard search offering. And just to the right hand side, we've got large sites where we've been involved in, in various different projects. We've, we've put either a, a 500 meter square grid or a one kilometer square grid, just to make searching a bit easier and to give some, uh, uh, relevance to various plans. Um, we know that construction doesn't happen everywhere at the same time um, and it might be an affordable measure to actually uh, just search certain areas um, and compile a model over a course of time um, rather than searching a, a, a very large area um, at, at great expense. And similarly where we've got irregular shapes you'll see this cable route down at the bottom of the screen and that will show where we can incorporate um, cable routes into our uh, utility search uh, processes and include access roads. And you'll see this as an example uh, of a wind farm, I think in the, uh, the eastern, eastern region of the UK. So there are a few different things that we can do. Following that, we follow the, uh, the REBA uh, project lifecycle. And so as your project moves along, uh, your uh, relationships with various utilities, whether they uh, uh, have apparatus on site, you can actually look through uh, you know, existing uh, legal information. So we provide things like Whaley's reports. Um, and as you go through the site, you'll look at maybe uh, diverting those uh, existing assets, perhaps. Um, you might be interested in capacity. Um, you might be interested to know what constraints might. There might be an oil pipeline running through your site. Um, that might be a, a complete stop um, of anything uh, going forward on that particular site. But until you know that, um, you don't know that, you know? Um, so we can provide a, a lot of different things in terms of diversions, capacity analysis, as I've mentioned, but also uh, for, for various developers, we look at budget and, and detailed new connections as well. So there's a few different services we can provide sort of later on. And where is the industry going? Well, I mentioned about um, utilizing these different file types. I've got a Google Earth uh, screenshot just uh, on the left-hand side there. Um, and we're actually using Street View. And okay, the problem we have at the moment is that not every utility uh, lists depth. And that is a, is a hurdle we're trying to overcome, but it does require a lot of utilities to uh, increase the amount of uh, information that's actually provided, which um, is a difficult job at the moment. Uh, but it's a challenge that is uh, improving uh, every day. Um, but we're using those different uh, software packages that people might be able to use. Um, and if, if somebody's got a, a KML package and can, uh, oh, sorry, if somebody's got Google Earth and can handle a, a KML file type, then we, we need to absolutely embrace that. Similar with, with QGIS as well, offering shape files. Uh, not everybody is, is running CAD and we appreciate that. Uh, and yeah, ex exactly with the uh, shapefile delivery, uh, we've got a completely online platform as well. So you can do all of this on your phone. If you get to a site, if you get to a particular 
particular point in the ground and uh, you know understand that you haven't got any existing uh, utility information, you can request that immediately. Um, there's also I mentioned about this disbursement engine as well, where we've compiled uh, 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 an idea as to where all utilities operate in the UK. Uh, and, and give you a, a, an easy calculator to work out exactly how much it's going to cost you to get um, a, a variety of plants. So looking in the future as well, um, 3D CAD deliverables. So again, that, that relies on depth. Um, we've got an augmented reality prototype. Um, I did read uh, an article the other day um, about a company that were providing uh, real-time uh, uh, site visualization using uh, using a mobile phone. Um, there's also a, a piece of software called Trimble Site Vision. We're very interested to, to look at that a bit more. Um, there's also uh, asset data int as data. Sorry, let me start that all again. Asset data integrate into nope. It's beating me that one. Asset data integration. There we go. Got there in the end. So this is where we're working with utilities to try and improve ourselves. Uh, but also to improve the uh, the ease of which it is to communicate the certain areas that we need to be searched, um, but also uh, to hopefully minimise actually how much work that that requires from uh, the the client side, but also the utility side as well. And I mentioned briefly about this uh, PAS 128 2020 review. Um, it's something my uh, my practice uh, has been been involved in the steering group with. Um, and I'm very interested to see how how that. Uh, uh, changes going forward. I'm also interested in the uh, uh, National Underground Asset Register. We know these sorts of uh, pilots have been done before and we, we stand here uh, ready to, to work with uh, the Geospatial Commission, uh, various other parties within that uh, uh, project um, and to provide our insights and, and to actually try and uh, get this thing going really. Um, we've we've uh, been engaged with, um, with the Geospatial Commission uh, you know, early, earlier this year and last year. Uh, I'm very interested to see how that, that progresses. And now we're up to Q&A. So I think I'm okay for time. It's just about half past. Um, I do have the, uh, the chat uh, available. So um, if, uh, if you've got any questions, I will uh, I'll get to answering them. Uh, Goshen, yeah, we've got a couple to, of uh... questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Tim, for your presentation. It was very informative. We know that every project pretty much will require exactly what you've been just, uh, you know, like presenting. Utilities, we know that they are everywhere and then like, either we do underground or overground work. Um, mm -hmm. We require this information. So very informative. Thank you. Good. We've got a couple of questions. Um, first question. What does affected means? I think that was affected utility. Affected, yeah. yes. So if you have an affected utility within your search area, it means that utility has assets within that area. Um, so it is affected um, by, your, by your search boundary. Um, and those plans will be provided uh, in, in, this, uh, in this report. Okay, thank you. Next question. How long are the searches valid for? Uh, validity, so 90 days is the guidance from PAS 128. Um, some utilities do have their own uh, separate uh, validity. It might be an area where uh, a lot of changes are expected. Um, it might be one specific utility that um, recommends these plans are, are updated every 30 days rather than every 90 days. So there's a couple of different uh, uh, you know, differences between some utilities, but best practice is, uh, is, is 90, 90 days. Okay, thank you. Another question. How do you think NUR will affect your service when it's fully rolled out? And then there is a comment, you didn't mention past 256. Do you think this is being followed and will it help improve record accuracy? Uh, yeah, so the first question is um, about new R and how it will affect our, our service. Well, um, yes, it will. If we uh, uh, have a, a one-stop shop using the National Underground Asset Register, it will need all the utilities buy-in. Um, and it, it, I imagine it will just um, maybe take a, a little bit of time to get set up. But um, I'll be interested to, to know how that's going to work. I, I don't know... Um, the exact specifics around it but yes it will it will affect um the work that we're currently doing but in the end of it um it's if it's an easy way to actually obtain 
uh, asset information across the country uh, in one place, then we need to embrace it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's for the good. Um, what I'm uh, outlining is we have a, a system at the moment um, where we, we do have that, that possibility, you know. Um, it's, a, it's a system that we, is up and running. So, yes, it will affect us, uh, uh, I, I think, as a, as a general rule, um, when it gets going. Um, and in terms of PAS 256, yes, this is a sharing of data. And I can just give you a bit of a anecdotal um, evidence where we had a particular electricity asset um, that was brand new. And through uh, initial verification, we could see that... Um, or well, the client informed us that there had been some uh, ground that had been disturbed recently, but didn't know how uh, or who by. Um, so we were able to actually understand that this new equipment wasn't on the existing electricity plans. Um, it was caught between that time of actually the work being done and the information being uh, attributed to this particular uh, electricity's uh, sort of you know asset database um, so we were able to go back to that utility uh, once uh, a client had actually done further investiga investigatory work um, and say actually you've got an asset there um, you need to update your uh, your asset records um, we've also been working with uh, the utility survey exchange as well and some of our clients provide some some data uh, where the utilities might not exactly be as they are uh, on plan which is uh, you know, very common occurrence. And so where these, uh, uh, you know, accuracies are, are being found or inaccuracies are being found, they are reported back. Uh, and, you know, where we do hear about um, uh, problems on sites or, or uh, extra assets being found, we make sure we're reporting them. But likewise, if um, some of the plans indicate that there are uh, utilities there, but in real life, actually, they're not, um, they're not installed yet. We do go back and say, look, there's nothing there. Is that correct? And just uh, go through all lines of um, inquiry. Um, so uh, yeah, PAS 256 is uh, focused on the sharing of data. Um, I, I would say I'm not an expert on, on PAS 256. Um, my, my role doesn't uh, get into the, the survey side of things an awful lot. And that's where you actually find um, really uh, a greater accuracy of information. Um, so I would refer, refer to um, probably another member of our um, utility subsurface mapping panel for that one. We've got one last question, but I think you've answered it, Tim, already. What do you do if an asset is not logged? Well, so exactly kind of that. Added. Yeah, so um, I'll give you an example. Uh, there was a, a, a fiber utility um, that had uh, installed some fiber and that wasn't logged. Um, similar situation to this electricity asset. Um, so number one, desk study. Um, so that's your, your uh, quality level D. Um, C is to actually go on site and have a look. If you can get some evidence of this particular asset, um, things like uh, junction boxes or anything above ground that you can actually see, it might be worth walking down uh, a footway or a carriageway um, to actually try and understand where this asset starts and finishes. If you can maybe see any information on the particular uh, you know, above ground infrastructure, if anything exists. Um, you can uh, call that particular utility for more information. Um, what you can also do is undertake more intrusive uh, 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 investigation. So that might be using GPR, it might be using Cat and Jenny, it might be using uh, even going as far as trial holes. But before you do that, you want to exhaust all the um, I say the, the easy things to do first, and that's actually obtaining as many plans as you can for that particular area to see what it could be. Um, so that's what I'd do if you find a, an asset that's not logged. Um, we've got one question more. Many companies have an SLA of more than five days. How do you deliver such turnaround and still a complete a comprehensive search so uh, the SLA of five days is, is common practice I would even go more and say actually a 10-day uh, service is, is probably the norm at the moment um, we've invested in a lot of techniques um, mostly using uh, existing relationships with utilities to either 
try and get that information uh, as quickly as possible, i.e. through uh, open access or uh, saying, look, we deal with a, a large amount of information on a daily basis. Um, is there a way we can make this, uh, uh, you know, a, a quicker process? Um, so that can be done. Um, but also where we've got, um, uh, you know, geospatial software where we can uh, uh, basically georeference some uh, some information all at the same time. Um, it actually gets through an awful lot of uh, different plans quite quickly. We've got a huge team, um, mostly I would say based at the Bristol office, but we're um, a little bit spread out at the moment. Uh, but we have a, a large team to actually make sure we can we can work as efficiently as possible. But there's a few different things that we can do just to to speed things up. And I would say we never recommend uh, undertaking you know an emergency one working day search. Um, because some utilities can't respond uh, in in one working day, um, so I'd always recommend the you know the longer turnarounds, um, even even recommending as much as a twenty working day uh, time. We've got another question. So when you receive all the information from asset owners, um, do you then digitalize it and combine it into one single map? Yes. <laughs> That's good. Yes. So it's, 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 it's information that is provided to us in a, a, a number of different ways. Um, some might provide shapefiles, some might provide layered PDFs. Um, yes, we can provide that, uh, the, the utility search map as a summary. Ultimately, we always make sure that the utility search report contains the actual plans from the horse's mouth. Um, so the, the map should be used as a, as a summary. Um, and, and to give an idea of, uh, of what utilities are there. Um, but we always make sure that the, the actual plans from utilities are there in the report um, and they should be used really as the, uh, the, the defining piece of information, you know. Okay, I think that's it. So thank you very much, Tim, again for presentation mm -hmm. and uh, thank you all for dialing in. Um, uh, please look out for Pipeline Industry Guild's future presentations. Uh, they are all on a uh, website. There are plenty of webinars organized by various branches. The next one from Southeast Branch is on the 7th of July, and it is everything you always wanted to know about uh, cathodic protection and straight current. So um, uh, looking forward to see you there. And uh, yeah, and have a lovely afternoon then. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.